Train man's back again. Well, here it is, 1361. Looks like a big brass model, right? Well, you know, I've been running this engine since 2004. So that's 14, 14 uh, well, 10, 14 years or 12, wait, uh, 2004, 2014 is 10, and then three, four more, three, this will be the 14th season that I've been running this engine. Okay, now, I have not repainted it in all that time, but you got to remember something here. I don't diddly bop around and pee, 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 real, be real careful and go real slow. I run this engine. It runs. It runs like the real engine. When I get out on that track, I run it like the prototype ran, hard and fast. I pull heavy loads, and it works, and I have no problems at all. One time, about a couple of years back, I broke this combination lever, and that was a casting. It might have had porosity in it or something, and it snapped. Well, I tried to solder it together. It wouldn't work because uh, it's manganese bronze or silicon bronze, I'm not sure. But I made a steel one, and that's fine. But now, okay, first of all, I never went to the trouble. I wasn't doing videos at the time about how I go about making this stuff, the jacketing. Now, my, my dear friend Dan Hording, who's uh, kind of like his mentor on this stuff, but he's doing a marvelous, marvelous job, and someday I'll tell you the story when we're all done when he's all done with his engine and how we got hooked up. But, look, look, you gotta hit that with a hammer and it won't go in. Why? Because underneath this stuff right here, I got three 30 second steel. All right, and I put, and I'll, I'll try to post some pictures, but here, here, here is all steel underneath there to, to form the shape. Okay, now I put, the, I put the jacketing on there, I weld it together, tack weld it with Heliarc, it's all on there, the only way you're going to get that off is to grind it off. Okay, so why do you do that? Well, real simple. See this here, thing right here? I have a piece of aluminum that goes there, and I got the thing right over here, in fact, I was just looking at it before. You've, you've seen these before. The height gauge, okay? So, what I do is I put it on the aluminum and I got this idea from the HO people. And, you know, okay, I want that in a certain spot. I go on the other side to make sure it's the same. Nothing looks worse than Cook it running boards. It looks like crap. Crap. So I got a nice straight edge here. Now, the one thing to uh, further improve that would be to have a way that connects to the track here so you have a straight edge that goes up exactly even to the track, which you can say, okay, center line, and then from that point, that, that straight edge to there is a certain distance. And you look on your cross sections and you get it working right. The only problem with that is sometimes here on this here, I'm a little bit wider in scale because of the of our great gauge problem that I was explaining to somebody yesterday. But anyway, you know, we're getting off the subject. But now, oh, one thing I want to mention. See this here? It's called the height gauge, right? Very common. I joined a, a site on the great Facebook, which I'm not excited about anymore for certain reasons. And... Um, on there, there was a site about machinists. So I said, oh, you know, maybe I can see different things in machinists. Guy comes on and he says, I have this tool, and I don't know what it is. He's showing this. This is the common of common of common tools. Now, I have another one over there, regular vernier height gauge with a scriber on it, a big one. It goes on a surface plate. You could use that, but this is simpler. I measure it, you know, and I set, set it up with the pointer and get everything level. This right here, this, where these go. Okay, now back to the jacketing. The jacketing is thick because I've seen this, I've seen this done. I've seen this done. 
Okay, there's this handrail stanchion right here. I've seen guys underneath there, they'll try to figure this out, they'll put a blob of crap under there and chewing gum weld to the boiler, which you're not supposed to do. But I do it, I built the boiler so I can do what I want. And then there, and then you need a blob up there, and a blob over here, and a blob over there, and a blob over there. Well, look, I use my little, I have it here on the ground right here, Fordham tool, drill it, punch it or whatever real lightly, drill a hole, tap it right through the thick jacketing. Now this brass you see is only 25 thousandths thick. Now, somebody, Steve Alley, okay, I know Steve. Steve says, oh, you got to take the jacket off. Yeah, well, let me see you take this off. This is all riveted on. This is drive rivets on there to simulate the riveting pattern. You never get that off. I'm not going to take the boiler off. you I got to be insane to do that. I took the running boards off. All that stuff comes off. I took the, some of the detail, like the little steps. I'm taking this pipe off because you can't paint underneath that. Same way with this. I'm probably not going to take the dome off. I'll take some of this piping back here off. That's my next step today. Get all this off and get this down. Uh, okay, so now, another thing. We're going to get to the painting in a minute. You can't probably see it in the picture, but right there there's a ding. Where did that come from? Well, we were up at the Washake and me and Dan a long time ago, and we're running in that, where that track is, right adjacent to the track, there's a power line, so there's an open space. And then on the other side of that, there's a woods. Well, personally, I'm riding around there, and personally, I hear this bing. Didn't think nothing of it. I got back, and I noticed that. I can almost guarantee that somebody took a pot shot at us with a BB gun. Now, that might sound stupid, but I think that's the case. Now, I have to try to see if I can slide something underneath between this and the steel and tap that out a little bit and then try to get that out. So I have to do that, or worst case scenario, put a little Bondo on there and smooth it out to get that down out of there. But uh, now this, like I said, this is 25,000 jacketing. Now, don't forget, see, this is a piece from here to right here, here to here. Now, in the back here, this is a little piece, this is a piece, this is a piece, that's a piece. Now, when you look at a locomotive, 99.99999% of all the pictures taken are from this direction. Now, if you know anything about doing aluminum siding, when you aluminum or vinyl siding, when you do the siding, uh, when you do the side of the house, you start in the back corner away from you, and you lay the panels this way towards the front. Why? Well, because when you look at it, you can't see the joints. There's a joint right here. You can't see that joint because you're looking this way. Well, you say, well, geez, were they really like that with all those metal panels? Well, of course they were. What do you think? They're going to get one gigantic piece of steel and put it over the top of the engine? They were pieces. Make your common sense to tell you that. Don't use a stovepipe. Don't use galvanized. Don't blew it. If you want to make a blue engine, then blew it. Well, I wanted the brass because it was easier to work with, and I could solder it if I had to. Like on these bell pair corners, I made a mold and I pounded it over that and I soldered it. You have to solder it. And, um, but that's all jacketing stuff we'll get into. Uh, now, I'm going to just clean right to right here, just a little bit below. This piece here I'm going to do now to show you. And I'm not going to go underneath there. Now, once I get this all clean and all the paint off it, I'm going to take it outside and I'm going to pressure wash this part of it here pressure wash all of this. I'm going to stay away from here because the pressure washing will actually mark that. So I'm going to do that and get all that grease off. Okay, now we're going to get to the paint remover. All right, you asked the question, what paint remover did I use? This is what I used. Come up close. Now you see it says there, right here, water soluble. Well, that's what it is. It's water-soluble paint, uh, paint remover. Rock Miracle. Never heard of it. I went to... Well, all right, so now, you got a little bit on the jacketing and the paint remover. Now, it's, it's like a, 
like a gel, okay? And it's not very liquidy. Okay, and now, say what you want. If you guys got a lot of money out there and you got nothing to do but burn it up, then go to places like um, some heavy-duty paint store where you're going to pay five, six, seven dollars for a pack of these here little acid brushes. Do yourself a favor. Go to the Harbor Freight. You want to call it Harbor Freight? You want to call it what you want. But basically, and I just thought of this, Harbor Freight is the dollar store for tools. Now, why would you want to spend? I paid two dollars for a big pack. Must be thirty of them in there. Same way with these brushes. I pay eight dollars for a, a hundred of them. I use them all the time. Okay. Now they don't have rags. They do have rags there, but they use these here pink, red-colored shop towels. And really, they don't get, stay away from those because they have a dye in them of some sort. And when you try to wipe stuff off, it turns a reddish color. So I'm going to go back down. Now you go to the Home Depot, and this is what they're good for. A box of rags. I forget what this is. There's a lot of them in there. 200 of them, it says. Probably more than that. I don't know. There's a lot. And you pull them out, and you use them. They're soft. They don't leave any residue. And you clean everything nice. Okay? Now, let's do this. We're going to put the stuff on. You take it, and you... Don't brush it on like you're brushing paint on. You put it like on, lib like, you know, heavy. Put it on there heavy. And you just put it on. I'm going to do a little spot for you. I want the air compressor's coming off. I got to rework it. And I go up here on this paint band here a little bit. You just go like that. And now you see these here? How do you get inside that hammer stuff? You just put some of that stuff in there. Put it on there like this. Now, I'm not taking the handrails off. Why? Because there's wires in them. Now, you can see that already. See what it's doing? It's peeling the paint. Peeling it right off. I don't know if you can see that, but there it is. It's peeling the paint off. I've waited a few minutes. In the meantime, while we're waiting, we'll talk some more about paint. Okay. Well, you want to use what's called etching primer. Alright, this here, the horror freight deal, etching primer. Okay. There's there it's self-etching, I should say. Now there's other primers. Um, zinc chromate if you can get it. This is good stuff. Uh, you paint it with that. Get it all painted and let it dry good. And then you put on the finished coat. All right, now here's where we get controversy with people. For some reason, they think this has rubber tires on it. This locomotive has rubber tires. Now you get what I'm saying? This is not an automobile. This is a locomotive. This is a scale model. Do not use automotive paint. It's just not the right color or the right consistency. A lot of those paints have metallic in them. You ever see a metallic painted locomotive? You're not going to believe this, but I use regular model paint. Now, a long time ago, and I don't know if Keith watches my drawing, my, my, my videos, but Keith Muldowney, Muldowney family, dear friends of mine, I don't see him as much as I used to. Uh, Keith is a very good modeler. And he was going to paint his locomotive like a southern green color. Well, that green is just perfect. You have to get a perfect green. It's, it's not Kelly green. It's not hunter green. It's southern green. Southern green. Now, these guys that use this, this model paint, they formulate these colors from the prototype. They get the, the proper information, and they make the colors right. Now... Pennsylvania locomotives. They are not Brunswick green. I'll say it again. They are not Brunswick green. It's what they call dark green locomotive enamel. D-G-L-E for short. 
That's what color this locomotive is. It's not hunter green. It's not this color. It's not that color. Believe me, the only people that ever got this color right is scale coat right here. Scale coat. Now you say, well, that's model paint. Well, yeah, but it's very, very good paint. It's top of the line paint. It's a very fine green paint, so it doesn't obliterate any of the detail. Um, you can buy it in quartz. You can buy it in spray cans. You can buy it in, I think this is a one ounce bottle, and you can buy it in two ounce bottles. You can get it from the company that's called Minuteman something. If you look up scale coat, just Google scale coat, and it'll come up. It used to be owned by Williams Company. Or no, Weaver? Weaver. Weaver had it, and then they sold it to this guy, and I, we almost lost it. But they have what they call, I love when they do that, railroad colors. They are not automotive colors. Stay away from automotive paint. This is, doesn't have rubber tires on it. Everybody says to me, geez, that engine looks so perfect. Well, yeah. You could have the best locomotive built in the world, but if it got a lousy paint job, well, it's got a lousy paint job. All right, let's see what's going on. Okay, now, back to the old horror freight. Two dollars, I got three little nice brushes. Look at that. Goodbye. Comes right off, okay? Now, you just take this here, and you take up the little rag here, and you wipe it off. Okay? And you just... Carefully do this because you don't want the stuff to get all over the place. All right, now I just wipe it down. You're a little square at a time, see? Now, in there, in between there, the old air gun. Just take it like this here. Go on. Now, I should... I wear a mask. Good old horror freight again. Little cheapy piece of crap, right? What you do is just hold it up in your front of your face like this and do that because, believe me, after a while you'll feel like a stinging feel sensation and that's actually this stuff working. Now this is, I don't know what this is. It's probably got some citrus in it. I don't know. But it's water soluble. That's the main thing. And why? Because I got a little bucket of water over here. And it's here. And you just do this. Kind of neutralizes it, see? Kind of neutralizes it. All right, you put that on there. Take the rag, wipe it off. It's not going to rust. It's brass. All right. All right, then, then now I have 600W wet and dry sandpaper. Put that on there, and if you need to, you just, you know, sand it down a little bit. And then when I'm all done, I'm going to take this and just give it a real light brushing. Or you can use uh, scotch Bright. You use scotch Bright, whatever you need to do. You get it down. And you wipe it down. Like I said, I'm going to take some degreaser. Either simple green or, better yet, lacquer thinner. And wash it down and degrease everything. And then cover it, and I and then try to paint it as soon as possible with the primer. Right. So now, they see down in here. I don't know if you can see that in the picture, but it didn't get that. I put a little bit here like this. Just put it on there. Now these pipes got to come off. They don't come off. I'm not taking a boiler off, Steve. Got to be insane. Maybe some little low 4 row or something you can do it. Not this engine. Boy, it don't come off that easy. All right. I've got to do a little better than that, you know. There's like spots in here. Adrian was doing this yesterday. He was having fun with this. But I, I don't like, I, I like to do everything systematically. My machinist uh, background, I can't multitask. Anybody understands that? Okay. So, there, it just comes right off. 
Harbor Freight. Go to go down here and get the Harbor Freight. Okay, now we're gonna get to the painting part of it. Okay, and get the water soluble. You want to remember that water soluble. That means it dissolves in water. In case those people don't understand what soluble means, All right, air gun. Now somebody asked me, why are we repainting it? Well, in the first place, I'm putting this locomotive up for sale. And the monies that I'm asking for, it, uh, you want to have it pretty nice looking. Now, I wish I could take the cab off. So one thing I can't do, I do not want to take off all of the electricals. I have to pull all the wires out of here, disconnect them. It's a real pain in the butt. So I'm going to go around that. But I really wanted to paint the... the inside of the cab. Now the inside of the cab is Kelly Green. That's the right color. This is dark green locomotive enamel. Top of the tender is freight car red or freight car color. It's a PRR color. I have it here somewhere. Here it is. PRR freight car red. The number is S81, scale coat 1. Now, scale coat 1 is an enamel, oil-based enamel. That's what you want. Scale coat 2 is, is plastic, for plastic. It's a, it's a water-based paint. Right, so that's the nice part about the scale coat. And you know what? It matches in. If you just spray a little spot, you want to fix it, it matches in. If you want to take a, a brush and diddly-bop around on there like in here, you can do it, and it all matches in perfectly. They also make a pen. It's like a pen, you know, a regular pen that you, you, you can touch up, like a magic marker. Yeah, it's expensive. Go, go get buy some automotive paint. See how much that costs you. Automotive paint's expensive also. I'll say it again. Stay away from automotive paint. It is not railroad colors. The other thing is automotive paint is thicker. It's a thicker paint. So when it gets around these rivets, instead of having a real nice sharp rivet line, you have this. All right, and it just looks like crapola, man. So I use the scale coat paint. You can get it online. You can buy it in the gallon cans if you want. I have bought it in gallon cans. I've used it. I've used it on my passenger cars years ago. I bought a gallon of it, and I didn't like Pullman green because the Pullman green was a little too dark, the scale color would be dark, but but um, I wanted them to look a little faded. So I bought what's called Great Northern Green, which is a little closer to a faded Pullman Green. And I painted those cars with that. And you know, I had what, 15 or 20 of these passenger cars between three, three friends, two, two other friends and myself. And we painted them with that Pullman green. And today, this is 45 years ago, the paint is still good. The paint is still good. Okay, so this is good quality paint. Don't write it off as a as a HO model. Now, here's where the, the, the mistake I made was. It says you don't have to prime it. Bullcrap, you got to prime it because it's got to be able to stick to this. Any place I primed it with any kind of primer on some of the running boards and stuff, underneath I primed them, they, it stuck it real hard to get off. That's why this came off so easy, because there's no primer. But I'm going to use primer now, and that's one of the main reasons why I'm repainting it, because if you get a little scratch in it, you, you use a certain amount of oil and grease, and there's oil coming out of the stack. It gets underneath there, and it lifts the paint. Let's talk about the smoke box over here. Smoke box color. All right. I've seen these people come out and they buy this here barbecue color or some crap and they paint it on there. It looks awful. Awful. Just awful. This is what I use. Can't get it no more. But I went to a hobby store just recently and I was able to get this. See what it says there? Gun metal. See what it says here? You can just about read it. It says silver. Okay? It's two of these to one silver. Two gun metal to one silver. 
the ratio, wherever how you make it. Mix it up, and this is hand painted with a brush. I gotta clean that, but it's hand painted with a brush. It lasts. It holds up under heat. Same way with this paint, by the way. This is cured with heat. So what I'm gonna do when I paint this, I'm gonna have some halogen lights on here to kind of dry it. Now, that's the other thing. I'm gonna to attempt to use this here. Japan dryer. Of course, I'm going to make a test. I'm going to make a test. I got a lot more of the brass up here to pieces. I want to make a test on there with the, the primer and everything. Make a test to see how it's going to work out. Um, but when it's all done, it'll be all painted. It'll all look good. I did it once before a couple of years ago, but I just kind of gypped it up a little bit. I didn't really take the paint off like I did here. So... I figure, hey, if somebody's going to pay big dinero for this locomotive, they're going to have, want to have it right. And uh, there's very, 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 very little, if any, mechanical problems with this locomotive. Uh, biggest problem I had broke that side, that, that combination. That was the biggest problem. Everybody said, oh, your nickel, your, your electroless nickel will not last. Look at that. Wash that down. I clean that. It's like they look like steel to me. Everybody thinks they are. They're brass. They're bronze. Yes, they're strong enough. Plenty. Pull five passenger cars loaded with people. No problem. 